Think Forward. Think Research Channel. gives me uh, both great professional and personal pleasure to inter introduce Dr. Uh, Michael Reed, who is, all you know, is uh, the professor uh, of uh, physiology and chairman of our Department of Physiology here at uh, UK. Um, he earned his PhD in physiology from uh, <coughs> UT Southwestern and began his faculty career as an assistant professor in a small community hospital, a community medical center in, in Boston on Longwood Avenue, Harvard Medical School. Uh, then he went to, uh, to um, Baylor and spent 14 years there before we were uh, so lucky to recruit him here to the University of Kentucky. Uh, he's going to speak to us about his uh, research interests and passion, which is oxidative stress um, and the study of free or radicals and skeletal muscle. But as you'll see, this is an area of science that really uh, applies to a variety of dis different disciplines, both basic and clinical, from muscle biology to cancer cell biology. So this is truly uh, deserving of our clinical and translational science uh, uh, lectureship. Mike, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Bill. I want to thank Dr. Balki for that very kind introduction. Um, thank Dean Perman for the invitation to speak here, and thank all of you, my friends and colleagues, for taking time out of your busy days to show up. Um, we're a muscle biology lab, and muscle biology is not something that gets talked about a lot in most medical centers. Our medical students hear a little bit about it, our graduate students hear a little bit about it, but it's not an area that gets a huge amount of attention. So I'd like to start up being a physiologist and doing a lot of teaching at the undergraduate level. I always have to sort of start off by defining things. So with your permission, your indulgence, um, let me remind you what we mean when we talk about muscle. So there are three types. There's cardiac muscle, which you hear a lot about. That's mostly because it fails and it kills people when that happens. So there's a lot of concern about taking care of that muscle. It's a critical muscle that is required for life. And um, obviously, you're well aware of that. Smooth muscle gets a little bit less attention. Smooth muscle is in the hollow organs of the body. So it's in your vascular system, it controls blood flow. It's in your lungs, it controls air flow. It's in your guts, it determines sort of where your lunch goes and when that happens. But the muscle that we study and the muscle that I was referring to in the title to this talk is skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is depicted here in this drawing by Vesalius, is attached to bone. So that's one hallmark of skeletal muscle. It's activated by nerves. Typically, these come from the brain down through the spinal cord and innervate the muscles. If the nerves don't activate the muscle, it doesn't contract. The muscles are responsible for both voluntary motion, that is my ability to wave at you, my ability to talk to you, and also involuntary motions that happen when you're not conscious of it. For example, you're breathing while you're asleep. In fact, you're breathing until I said that. So what I'd like to talk with you about today is some conditions where muscle is affected by disease or it's affected by the environment and the impact that that can have on folks, possible mechanisms that are responsible for that, and therapeutic interventions that we may be able to develop to help people retain muscle function. So in our laboratory, we have two general lines of investigation that are illustrated here. Um, on the left-hand side, you see astronaut Ed Liu after six months on the International Space Station. This guy illustrates the effects of gravitational unloading. You can see that Ed's very happy to be back safely. Who wouldn't be? Um, but he's not being carried off in triumph because these are his best friends. He's being carried off because after six months in microgravity, his anti-gravity muscles don't work well. He's weak. Astronauts have a hard time readjusting to 1G when they get back. The president has given the NASA an, uh, a mandate to create manned space flight that would be capable of making it to the moon and to Mars. We're talking about having crews in space in microgravity environment at least for months to years. 
So it's important that we be able to keep their muscles healthy. As you'll see later in the talk, we think that this has a broader clinical implication as well. On the right-hand side, you see a drawing by Frank Netter of a fellow with emphysema. He illustrates the phenotype of many chronic inflammatory diseases. If it weren't for his braced elbows here and his pursed lips, this could be someone with cardiac cachexia. It could be someone with cancer cachexia. This type of, this type of appearance is very common with chronic inflammation, and the patients suffer from this. Patients who become cachectic, who lose muscle function, are more ill for longer and are more likely to die in chronic disease. So we're concerned about how to help these folks as well. As different as they look, there are in fact some fundamental underlying themes that are common to these apparently disparate conditions. So first of all, um, adaptation both to spaceflight and to chronic disease often causes muscles to get smaller, what we call atrophy. This is what you'd expect to see. It's what Frank Netter was depicting in this drawing. If you see people with small muscles, you figure they're going to be frail and you figure they're going to be weak. This biology is extremely interesting. It's something that we work on. It's a very dynamic area in the field of muscle biology right now. Um, we know a lot about it. It requires changes in gene expression, cellular adaptation with increases in protein breakdown and decreases in protein synthesis, which we don't have time to cover today. So with your indulgence, I'm going to put that off for some other venue and instead focus on the other items on this list. When I say weakness today, what I mean by that is a decrease in force for a given mass of muscle. So this doesn't have to do, this is beyond atrophy. This tells us that the muscle that exists is not functioning properly. Sometimes I'll use the word contractile dysfunction, meaning that the contraction process is not working well. We'll also talk about fatigue. Fatigue is similar. That is, it, muscle mass hasn't changed. Force production is less. But in the case of fatigue, the hallmark there is that this loss in function is stimulated by repetitive muscle activity. And then finally, I'll talk a fair amount about redox biology and the concept of oxidative stress. You hear this term thrown around a lot. What I mean by this is simply an, an imbalance between oxidant production by muscle and the antioxidant buffers that are in muscle. And typically in these conditions up here, the oxidative stress is caused by an overproduction of free radicals and their derivatives. So this oxidative stress, we think, plays an early upstream role in all of these functional deficits. So perhaps I'd like to start by just going over the basics of what we mean by oxidative stress and how we think it functions in a muscle cell. To my knowledge, this is the first report that skeletal muscle makes free radicals. It was published in Nature, 1954, Free Radicals and Biological Materials by Commoner and his colleagues. Over here, you see a list of biological tissues that were tested. Uh, for Kentuckians, you notice the first two were tobacco leaf and tobacco root. But about halfway down the list, we've got rabbit muscle. And there were detectable signals from rabbit muscle. Muscle had free radicals in it. In the ensuing 50 years, we've learned a great deal about what these free radicals are actually made of, how they get generated, where they go, what their biological importance is. This drawing, which is from Melissa Smith, she's a graduate student in our program, and she published a review article last year with this figure in it. With her permission, I'm going to use this to illustrate the basics of this biology. The figure depicts a muscle cell. On the right-hand side, we've got sources and types of free radicals that muscles make. And on the left-hand side, We've got the contractile machinery inside the cell and the calcium regulatory machinery that are responsible for contractile function. This line across here is supposed to be the cell membrane. So let's look first at sources. We have a number of sources, and this is just a partial depiction. Um, skeletal muscle constitutively expresses nitric oxide synthase, which makes nitric oxide. It also contains NADPH oxidase complexes, contains mitochondria, which generates superoxide anion radicals. These two parent radicals then give rise to a cascade of redox active derivatives. For example, peroxynitrite, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals, which can be measured in muscle, are present both inside muscle and on the outside of muscle. 
and we think that they play a role in modulating function. Now, these free radicals are opposed inside the cell by antioxidant buffers that limit the activity of these oxidants. And there are a few of those that are illustrated. These are just enzymes that are shown. So inside mitochondria is manganese SOD. Outside is superoxide SOD. Both of these will degrade the superoxide anion. Catalase is present in the cell, which degrades hydrogen peroxide. Glutathione peroxidase is inside the cell and is a major component of the glutathione cycle, perhaps the most important antioxidant mechanism in eukaryotic cells, period, muscle in particular. So before oxidants get degraded, they have the opportunity to interact with this side of the diagram over here, the elements of the muscle cell that regulate contraction. So contraction in skeletal muscle is initiated by an action potential at the membrane which triggers calcium release from this structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The calcium then floods the cytosol and it activates contraction of the myofibrillar proteins shown down here as a complex. At the end of excitation, the calcium is taken back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the myofibrillar proteins can then relax. That's the basics of it. For more detail, come to any of our physiology courses. We'd be glad to have you. So it's our belief, based on the data in the literature from us and many other laboratories, that those two sides of that diagram, the oxidant production side and the contractile regulation side, are very closely linked. And this model depicts what we see at the functional level. On the x-axis, down here on the bottom, you have reactive oxygen content. You can think of it as oxidant activity. Out here is high levels of oxidants. Here's low levels of oxidants on the left-hand side. The y-axis is force. It goes from zero force up to 100% or maximal force that a muscle can generate. And what you see is that it's a biphasic relationship. There is some level of oxygen, oxidant activity where muscle performs optimally, it generates the most force that it can. If you have fewer oxidants, the muscle loses force production, it gets weaker. If you have more oxidants, the muscle loses force and it gets weaker. We think that right now under basal conditions, your leg muscle, you've recovered from taking the stairs, you've been sitting for a while, you're at basal conditions. If that's true, then your muscles are about where letter A is on this graph. So this is basal. You'll notice it's off to the left a little bit. It's relatively low oxygen, oxidant content. If you were to apply antioxidants to your resting muscle, you would decrease the oxidant activity in the muscle, and you'd push it down the curve like this. Force would go down. If you increase oxidant activity in your muscle, you'll actually get a little increase in force, and then force falls off the curve in this direction and you start to get weak. So too much oxidant activity, too little oxidant activity, either is a bad thing. Now, let me illustrate this for you, at least part of these responses, using some original data. The data will come from a preparation like this. This is a fluorescence micrograph. It shows um, an isolated single fiber from mouse flexor digitorum brevis. That's a toe muscle in the mouse. And this picture was given to me by Dr. Paco Andrade. He's a senior faculty member here in the physiology department who's done a lot of work with this preparation. The advantage of this prep is that you can load it with a calcium dye and you can also hook it up to a force transducer. So you can simultaneously measure both parts of Missy Smith's diagram. You can measure the calcium regulation and at the same time you can measure the force production by the myofibrillar proteins. Original tracings are shown in this figure. So in the upper left-hand panel, you've got a calcium tracing. You see it starts at roughly zero, very low calcium levels in the resting fiber. When Dr. Andrade turned on an electrical stimulator, it caused calcium release in the muscle. And so you see that calcium levels in the cell rise. When the stimulator gets turned off, the calcium concentration goes back to normal levels as the calcium gets taken up into the SR. This calcium is the activating signal for the myofibrillar proteins which generate force. That's shown in the lower left-hand tracing. Here's force on the y-axis versus time. So you can see that force rapidly rises once calcium comes up. 
It stays elevated as long as calcium is elevated. And then as soon as the calcium starts to fall, force starts to fall. These sorts of measurements can be made at lots of different stimulation intensities. And when you do that, you can measure the calcium content, and you can measure the force production, and you can create a graph like this, which plots the force production versus calcium activation. So with just a little bit of calcium activation, you get a little bit of force. More calcium activation, more force. And then up here somewhere, you get to the point where the muscle can't generate any more force. That's maximal, no matter how much you increase the calcium. And this sort of calcium force relationship is typical both for skeletal muscle and also for cardiac muscle laboratories. Now, let's use that preparation to give you an example of how that muscle, that muscle um, model was derived. So here's the model that you've seen before. We're going to start with the fiber in the, basal prediction at a, in the basal position at A. And that's reflected by this contraction on the far left-hand side. Looks very much like what you just saw. Here's the calcium transient. Here's force production. This is, what, this is how the fiber behaves under basal conditions. Now, Dr. Andrade added some hydrogen peroxide, 300 micromolar, that's a lot. When he did that, force dropped precipitously. So we would imagine that the fiber has been pushed over the hump and is down here on this part of the curve someplace. Then Dr. Andrade took off the hydrogen peroxide and exposed the fiber to dithio 3 et al. This is a thiol reducing agent. It functions as an antioxidant. And when he applied the dithio 3 et al, force came back. We imagine that he pushed the environment of the cell away from the high oxidant environment back toward the basal environment, thereby restoring force. So these data show you a couple of things that to me are pretty striking. Number one, this is a huge change in myofibrillar function and yet, it's acutely reversible. This isn't calpane clipping. This isn't that we've killed the cell. It's some sort of reversible modulation at the myofibrillar level that can profoundly alter force production. The other thing that's interesting, look at the calcium signal. It didn't change. That tells you that the myofibrillar proteins downstream of the calcium signal are more sensitive to oxidants than the calcium regulating mechanism itself. This is a fundamental observation that we and other labs have made in a variety of settings. And so right now, we're pretty much convinced that the myofibrillar proteins are the canary in the coal mine. They tell muscle when oxidative stress is developing. This is evidence of myofibrillar dysfunction caused by reactive oxygen. These are data that were generated by Dr. Leanne Callahan. Dr. Callahan, at the time she generated these data, was at the Medi at Medical College of Georgia. Since then, we've been fortunate to recruit her to the Department of Internal Medicine. While she was there, one of the experiments that she did involved exposure of skinned muscle fibers to hydroxyl radicals. Remember, you saw those in one of those diagrams I showed you. Hydroxyl radicals have very similar effects to what Dr. Andrade saw with hydrogen peroxide. In the upper right-hand corner, you have a forced calcium curve. The closed symbols show the normal forced calcium relationship for a skin fiber. The open symbols show you the same forced calcium relationship after exposing the myofilaments directly to hydroxyl radicals. So this is consistent with the data that Dr. Andrade generated. If you normalize these two curves for maximal force, then you can look at the slope of this relationship. And you see that the hydroxyl radical stimulated fibers the slope is pretty close to the control slope. That tells us about calcium sensitivity, and it tells us that calcium sensitivity itself was not much affected. Primarily, this was an effect on maximal force. So this gives you an idea of the sort of basic cell biology we have in the back of our minds when we think about what's going on in experimental animals and in humans. So let's move forward and start to talk more about the functional implications of this biology. I'd like to start with this concept of weakness, of contractile dysfunction. Um, this being a room full of medical professionals and medical researchers, let's start with this sick guy over here and talk about the effects of chronic inflammatory disease. Now, I put this picture in here to sort of illustrate a point. You remember I keep telling you that it's not all about muscle mass? Look at these two pictures. 
So here's Dr. Netter's depiction of a sick guy. And here is the winner of that Honolulu Marathon last year. If you look at their phenotype, it ain't that different. Look at the arms on this fellow, look at the arms on that fellow, they're pretty similar. But no one would accuse this person of suffering contractile dysfunction. This illustrates the marked difference that can occur with no real changes in muscle atrophy. Data depicting that are shown in this bar graph, which is from a publication by Harrington et al. 10 years ago. What Harrington et al. did is they measured limb muscle strength in patients with chronic heart failure. They were doing knee extension exercise in this particular graph. Here you see the control group that was matched for age and sex. Here you see the patients with chronic heart failure. This force is normalized for cross-sectional area. It's normalized for the size of the muscles. And you can see that there's significant weakness despite that normalization. Why do folks with chronic inflammatory disease lose muscle function? These diseases aren't in the muscle. This fellow is supposed to have disease of the lungs. Heart failure, your heart is sick. With uh, rheumatoid arthritis, your joints are sick. Cancer, the tumor may be located far from the skeletal muscles that are weakened. How is it that these remote sites cause weakness in muscle? The current belief in the field is that it's caused by an elevation of proteins called cytokines in the blood of these sick individuals. And there are particular cytokines that are implicated by this. Interferon gamma is listed here along with interleukin-1 alpha, TNF alpha, all of which are thought to stimulate muscle atrophy and muscle weakness. At the cellular level, there's increasing evidence that free radicals function as second messengers for these cytokines, doing the dirty work inside the cell. The free radicals that are produced by muscle include both nitric oxide derivatives and also reactive oxygen species. So the question is, in this list, and it's actually only part of the total list, which are really important. Data from our lab, data in the literature, both in humans and in experimental systems, suggests that the most damaging cytokine is tumor necrosis factor alpha. It has the strongest catabolic effect on muscle. It has the most robust effect on muscle function. So we think that TNF alpha is a major focus for this work. Inside the cell, chronic inflammation, like you get with long-standing disease, is probably mediated by reactive oxygen species, not nitric oxide derivatives. So I'm going to show you some data that link these two cytokines to the loss of muscle function I've been describing. These are data that we collected using transgenic mice. This is a genetic model of heart failure. These mice are engineered for cardiac-specific overexpression of TNF-alpha which results in myocardial pathology that mimics the myocardial pathology you see in humans. This takes time. So these mice die prematurely due to this heart failure, but we didn't want to study that. We wanted to catch them before that happened. We didn't want them to be cachectic, to lose muscle mass. So we studied them when they were younger, when body weight and muscle structure appeared to be normal. You could not distinguish these mice from their littermate controls by looking. We were very surprised to find that diaphragm function in these animals, diaphragm is your primary muscle of breathing, it's a skeletal muscle, and it was severely weakened in these animals. Let me show you. So here are force frequency curves. Instead of calcium across the bottom, I've got stimulation frequency. You remember the stimulation frequency increases calcium release, so those two things are pretty similar. And here you've got force normalized for cross-section on the y-axis. This upper relationship with the open symbols, that's the control animal. These are muscles from littermate controls that do not overexpress TNF. The closed symbols depict the transgenic muscle from the animals that did overexpress TNF. And as you can see, specific force, the force per unit area, is down by about 50% at every stimulation frequency. This is a big effect. So there's a question. You've had mice that have been overexpressing TNF for many weeks and months. Is this an effect of the cytokine or is this some other effect? Is it because they weren't eating right or because they developed some secondary infection or something? So to test that, we took normal diaphragm from just standard laboratory mice. We put them in a muscle bath and we bought some TNF from Sigma and we put it in the bath 
to see if TNF-alpha would cause this kind of weakness. Those data are shown on the right-hand side. So this is exogenous cytokine applied to normal muscle. Here's the stimulus frequency, here's the force, here's the control relationship, here's the relationship of normal muscle that has been incubated directly with TNF. You get that same loss in force across the entire stimulation frequency spectrum. Loss of force, one observation. Second observation is an increase in oxidant activity in the muscle fibers of these muscles. Um, on the y-axis is DCF emissions. That's an assay that we use to measure oxidant activity in the cytoplasm of living cells. And we compared, we did paired comparisons between litter mate control animals and transgenic animals. We took two muscles and, and put them in the bath together and measured the oxidant activities. And what we found in five out of six paired comparisons is that the transgenic muscle had higher oxidant activities. If we did that control experiment using exogenous TNF and normal um, diaphragm preparations, here you've got control conditions with normal muscle in buffer. Here you've got normal muscle exposed to TNF, and you get the same response. Five out of six go up. So TNF is causing muscle weakness, and it is causing an increase in oxidant activity. Are those two things linked, or are they simply true, true, and unrelated? The way to test causality is to block the oxidant activity and see if you protect function. Those data are shown in the next slide. So these graphs are familiar to you. The dashed lines and the axes have been transposed from a previous slide. So here's transgenic muscle. Here's force of the, of the litter mate controls. Here's the transgenic force. These data are new. You haven't seen these before. Force has been elevated in the transgenic muscle by incubating that muscle with N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is a thiol donor and a nonspecific antioxidant. There are a lot of clinicians in this audience. You know N-acetylcysteine as something that's given in the emergency room for acetaminophen overdose to protect the liver. It's given in the imaging suite. When you want to protect people who are getting renal contrast studies, N-acetylcysteine protects the kidney from the effects of the dye. So it's very safe. We've been using it clinically for 50 years. and it appears to partially reverse this TNF-induced weakness. This is really striking. This is another one of those bits of data that says, look, this is acutely reversible. This is one hour with N-acetylcysteine after eight or 10 weeks of TNF exposure. So it's telling us that the decrease in force per unit area, again, is not, does not require remodeling over one hour to increase force. It's not that you've grown a bigger fiber. This is some sort of acute response that can be acutely reversed. These data simply show the effects in vitro using control muscle. Here's the control relationship, the control exposed to TNF-alpha. And here, if you pretreat normal muscle with an antioxidant and then you give TNF, you virtually abolish the effect of TNF. So the oxidants inside the cell are essential for creating the weakness and for maintaining the weakness. If you get rid of the oxidants, the muscle starts to recover very quickly. So I just told you N-acetylcysteine can be given to humans. So the obvious opportunity here for translational research, you know, it's just staring us in the face. We have to do something with this. So we're currently pursuing a study to look at the effects of N-acetylcysteine on patients with congestive heart failure. I'm working with Dr. Leo Fajera. He's a senior postdoctoral fellow who's with us today who is helping to drive this project. Dr. Deborah Mosier is a professor over in the College of Nursing. She's been working with us on this. We hope to recruit patients, CHF patients, from UK outpatient clinics. We want to measure hand grip strength and fatigue, and then test the ability of NAC to make their hand grip strength and fatigue better. We want to see if we can make them stronger with this antioxidant. Um, a, a little plug, we want to thank the UK GCRC for a little bit of money that's supporting this project over the next year or so. So this weakness story has an obvious translational direction to it. Let's go back and talk about dysfunction in a different setting. So now we're going to talk about weakness caused by muscle unloading, mechanical unloading. That's illustrated by this astronaut during um, what's called extravehicular activity, a spacewalk. Um, obviously, there's no gravity acting on this person's anti-gravity muscles. NASA cares about this because it lets those muscles get little and get weak. So NASA wants to fix this. 
And they study that using two preparations. One preparation is shown down here in the lower right hand side. It's a bed rest study where they take volunteers, they put them in bed for weeks or months, and they measure the loss of performance in muscle. Um, those of you who are clinicians will recognize this scene for lots of other reasons. We have hospitals full of patients who are confined to prolonged bed rest. So as a sidebar, we as medical college faculty members are very interested in this biology, not just because it will benefit a handful of astronauts in the astronaut corps, but because it may benefit down the, long, down the road hundreds or thousands of patients who are subject to prolonged bed rest. So we're going to look at some data from bed rest studies, and we're also going to look at some data from animal experiments where you unload the hind limb muscles of mice and watch them. They adapt just like the muscles of astronauts do, and it's a lot cheaper and it's a lot faster than doing bed rest studies in humans. But the human data first. These are not our data. These are from Padden, Jones, et al. They were published about three years ago. And in this experiment, they had normal folks in bed like this. One leg was a control leg. They watched it get smaller and get weaker. The other leg did exercise, said did knee extension exercise in bed to see if exercise would benefit the astronauts. So here are data on the change in leg mass, the size of the leg. Under control conditions, just as predicted, when you put these folks to bed, their legs got smaller. They lost muscle mass. And if they exercised, to the delight of the astronauts, their legs got bigger. So they can use exercise to protect muscle mass. You remember, I keep telling you that mass alone is not the whole story. This is muscle function. Same group of patients. Here's the control leg. There's a drop in, specific, in, in leg muscle strength. You remember that the exercise leg got bigger, but the force is still significantly less than when they went to bed. So saving muscle mass by itself is not sufficient for normal function. These are data from uh, Todd Trappi's group over at Ball State in Indiana. They took muscle biopsies from bed rest patients. And they looked directly at the muscle fibers. They did single fiber studies, like Dr. Andrade's studies that I showed you. And they looked at the function of these muscle fibers after bed rest. Those data are shown here. Now the symbols are a little bit different. So the dark bars represent changes in the control fibers. And the light bars represent the, the changes in muscles that were exercised during bed rest. So if you look at the open bars, you can see that the diameter of the muscle fibers stayed the same, maybe went up a little bit. And the velocity of shortening of the muscle fibers was protected. These two things were protected by exercise. They didn't drop like in bed rest. But every other bed rest uh, parameter that dropped, like maximal force, force per unit area, absolute power, uh, normalized power, all those things dropped in bed rest, and they were still diminished in those muscle fibers, even though the size of the fibers was the same. This comes back to the concept of dysfunction in us when our muscles are unloaded. So we study this to get a better understanding of mechanism and to start trying out countermeasures using mouse experiments. Here's our preparation. These little guys actually do great with this preparation. They motor around in there for 10 days to two weeks with no problems. They groom well, they continue to grow, they explore. It's a remarkably pleasant environment for them. You might not think so being hung up by your tail, but it seems to be true. The changes that happen in their hind limb muscles are identical to the changes that happen in astronauts in bed rest. So here are some data that go back to this story I'm telling you about oxidant activity and the link to changes in muscle function. So these are unloading days on the bottom. From zero out to 12 days, we unloaded these mice. On the right-hand axis, you've got muscle weight of soleus muscle. It's an anti-gravity muscle. And the data are shown with these open triangles. And you can see that force rapidly falls over the first three days, and then it starts to flatten out in the later period. At the same time, you have a mirror image when you look at oxidant activity shown on the left-hand axis and with the closed symbols. Oxidant activity in the muscles goes up very rapidly in the first three days, and it stays up for the rest of the time the animals are unloaded. So you've got muscle atrophy and you've got an increase in oxidant activity. What about this weakness? What about this dysfunction story? 
Those data are shown here. Here's normalized force, here's stimulus frequency, here are control soleus muscles from animals that have just been running around in the cage for 12 days. Here's the soleus muscle from animals that have been hind limb unloaded for 12 days. Force per unit area is down by about 40%. So this is normalized for atrophy. This is force per unit area. The nice thing about mice is we can give them compounds to see if we can protect muscle mass. And it turns out that antioxidants are beneficial. I'll show you one set of data. This is one experiment. Let's see, this was the paper published in 2004. Here you've got force per unit area versus stimulus frequency. Here's the normal relationship at the top with the open symbols. The unloaded muscle is at the bottom with the closed triangles. And then in the middle, the open triangles, those are mice that were unloaded for 12 days, but that ate allopurinol. You know allopurinol. Allopurinol is used to treat gout. It's a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. It has antioxidant properties. Well, it apparently works in this setting to protect um, normalized force. So it turns out that there are a number of antioxidants that have beneficial effects either on muscle mass or on force per unit cross-section, sometimes both. Trolox um, is not approved for use in humans, but these other four are, including allopurinol and acetylcysteine we've talked about. Another group down at NASA has done a project using an antioxidant diet with a variety of nutritional antioxidants. And we've most recently published a story with BBIC. This is a nutritional supplement that comes from soybeans. It's a protein supplement. And it, has, it is the most protective compound that we've tested so far. So the good news is that all four of these last four agents here could be given to humans tomorrow. There are some agents that are not effective, vitamin E and curcumin, they could be given to humans, but they don't protect muscle in our hands. So the next obvious step is maybe to do bed rest studies and to give patients in bed rest one or more of these supplements to try to preserve muscle function. We're currently talking with colleagues at NASA Johnson Space Center about trying to develop something through NASA in that regard. Um, it's a big project. We're not there yet, but that's where we'd like to go. All right, what about fatigue? I told you we'd talk about fatigue. Fatigue is a decrease in force with no change in muscle mass that, that happens because of exercise. Before I show you data, I want to tell you a story. You remember that Nature paper that we looked at? It was published in 54. In the ensuing 30 years, up to the early 80s, we knew that free radicals were in muscle. We didn't know much else about it. And then in the very early 80s, several landmark papers showed, using that same technology, electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy, that free radical content goes up in human muscle when you exercise. And this set off a flurry of activity among exercise scientists, kinesiologists, nutrition people, to see if we could give nutritional antioxidants and preserve athletic function. Vitamin C. Vitamin E, beta carotene, related antioxidant nutrients were given by dozens of groups in this country, in Europe, in Australia. Those antioxidant supplements had various effects on some of the biochemistry of oxidative stress. So when, pay, when, when, their, when their volunteers exercised, you'd see a decrease in lipid peroxides or you'd see a decrease in glutathione oxidation or something. But under no circumstances was performance enhanced. So that field developed growing skepticism about the importance of free radicals as causing muscle fatigue. This skepticism is illustrated nicely in this quote from a review article. The article was written by Koenig et al. It was an exercise immunologic reviews. And it says as follows, quote, although the theoretical background may be sound, there is no scientific evidence to recommend increased quantities of antioxidants to physically active people exceeding the amount provided by a healthy, balanced nutrition." End of quote. At that point, the nutritionists and the exercise scientists were mostly through. That was it. We're done. But there was this whole other community of people, physicians, who were worried about fatigue of other skeletal muscles. They didn't want to make their patients run faster. They wanted to make their patients breathe and get off of mechanical ventilation. They were concerned about inspiratory muscle fatigue. Physicians don't give nutrients. Physicians give drugs. 
So when these people became interested in stopping fatigue, and they knew this story about free radical biology, they approached this the way their profession is trained to approach stuff. They used the best tools at their disposal, which in this case happened to be N-acetylcysteine. What I'm showing you now are landmark data. This is the first demonstration that antioxidants inhibit muscle fatigue. It was N-acetylcysteine was the drug that was used. This was an animal experiment that was conducted by Dr. Jerry Sapinski. Dr. Sapinski slipped in a little late to this talk, but he's here. We were lucky enough to recruit him to the university earlier this year. He was at Case Western Reserve when this work was done. And this established a whole field for the rest of us to follow along and try to understand. What you see here is force on the y-axis versus time. This upper closed circle curve is the control relationship. And you see that during this period labeled rhythmic contraction, force progressively falls. This is diaphragm force. The muscle is in situ. Vascular connections are intact. The muscle is stimulated via the nerve. It's a very physiologic preparation as these things go. And what you see now is classic fatigue. When you turn the stimulator off, the diaphragm starts to recover force production, just as you'd expect. So now what happens when you give these same, well, give similar rabbits in acetylcysteine intravenously? That's the data from the open symbols. Oh, I've described the graph wrong. Sorry. This, of course, is the control relationship with big fatigue. This is the anastylcysteine treated curve, the upper curve. You can see that the drug enhanced force by almost 50%, a profound diminution of the fatigue that this muscle experienced. So thankfully, his experiment was much better than my explanation of it. It certainly was convincing, and it certainly pushed a lot of us in that direction. Now, I can't begin to show you all these data. I will show you a handful of data that I think are particularly interesting that brings you up to where we are now in this field. So a few years after that, our group down at Baylor did experiments in normal humans to see if acetylcysteine would also work in people beyond rabbits. So this is relative force versus time. This is a limb muscle preparation. We had electrodes over tibialis anterior, which is a lower limb muscle, and we were measuring the force produced during ankle dorsiflexion. So that force is shown on the y-axis over about 30 minutes of repetitive fatiguing exercise. The control relationship is shown at the bottom with the open symbols and the dashed line. The same individuals came back a week later. We gave them N-acetylcysteine, and that's shown in the upper curve with the solid line. So using subjects as their own control, you could show that N-acetylcysteine inhibits fatigue in human muscle. This is peripheral fatigue. We've taken the central nervous system out of this because we're stimulating the motor point with cutaneous electrodes. So all right, you can get, you know, this is sort of a, a laboratory trick. Does it have any physiological relevance? Is it important in vivo? Those answers came from Australia. These are two publications that came out in the last few years from Dr. Michael McKenna's group. The first was in 2004 in Journal of Applied Physiology. The title of it says it all. in acetylcysteine enhances muscle cysteine and glutathione availability. Those are antioxidant stores in the muscle. It's doing what it's supposed to do. And it attenuates fatigue during prolonged exercise in endurance trained individuals. This was cycling exercise. These were elite athletes. They know how to push themselves to the limit. If you give them in acetylcysteine, they can ride further. They came back and repeated an experiment to begin looking at mechanism. This was published in the Journal of Physiology last year. The title here, in acetylcysteine, attenuates the decline in muscle sodium potassium pump activity. This is an aspect of cellular mechanism that this group is particularly interested in. And again, they showed that it delays fatigue during prolonged exercise elite cyclists doing cycle exercise. So this is volitional. It's got all the components in place, the central nervous system, blood flow, in vivo, physiologic, whole body, and you inhibit fatigue. So it's real. Where do we go from there? Well, as I said, our laboratory doesn't do sports medicine. And now if Billy G comes down and he wants help with the basketball team, we're here for him. But mostly what we're interested in is we're interested in making sick folks better. So we're using 
a more focused strategy to begin testing in acetylcysteine for its protective effects on muscle fatigue in a variety of conditions. Now what we're paid to do by NASA is to study its effects as it would relate to astronauts. Astronauts, during EVA, astronauts have real problems with hand grip fatigue. Their hands cramp up, they can't do their work, it prolongs EVA and sometimes prevents them from getting their work done. So NASA wants to prevent that from happening. So they've given us an ergometer, this is shown here. It's got a computer control program and you can measure force production during hand grip. This is a unit that's supposed to go on the International Space Station. And we did experiments with this unit to see if hand grip fatigue would be protected by inacetylcysteine so that we could use this as a tool to test inacetylcysteine effectiveness. The short answer is yes. In this center graph, it's a bar graph that shows glutathione oxidation in blood coming from the muscle groups. Before, before exercise, um, here's the control values. At the end of exercise, there's a lot of glutathione oxidation. It shows oxidative stress, which reverses immediately as soon as you stop exercise. Now, if you pretreat these same people with inacetylcysteine, that's the open bars, you prevent the glutathione oxidation. So you've blunted the oxidative stress. You also improve performance. Over here, you've got successful repetitions. That's an index of endurance. These are different sessions, days apart. So here are practice sessions, run-ups to the formal experiment. So here's successful repetitions at 100%, and they stayed pretty stable. Then you give them inacetylcysteine, and it goes up about 30%. So this is an increase in hand grip endurance with inacetylcysteine using subjects as their own controls. This is great for the astronaut corps. We can give it to them and go down to JSC and, and do other studies to see if it's relevant in a spacesuit, and we want to do that. But more importantly, we want to see if this is relevant to our patient populations. This circles back around to that collaboration I was telling you about with congestive heart failure patients. The reason that I put this guy on this figure is to remind me that we're now looking for this same responsiveness in patients with heart failure. That's the goal of the pilot study that we're conducting with Dr. Fahera and Dr. Moser. And it's using this approach that we'll analyze it. So where are we in this field? What can we conclude up to this point? First of all, as scientists, we think that a lot more mechanistic research is needed. We do not know the source of reactive oxygen species in muscle, although we can list candidates. We don't know the mechanism by which reactive oxygen acts to cause fatigue. It could be a direct effect on the myofilaments, but it might not. It might be a redox-sensitive kinase, for example, that phosphorylates specific proteins and thereby alters function. We don't know and want to study that. And what's the target of ROS action? Which proteins are being modified? We're collaborating with several laboratories that are present in this, in this auditorium now to look at redox proteomics with Dr. Butterfield, to look at changes in phosphorylation state with Dr. Sumandea, to try to figure out which of these myofibrillar proteins are being affected by this oxidative challenge. And from a translational standpoint, I think the data are starting to show us that novel interventions are possible to preserve muscle function. I think that it's got potential application in chronic disease, potential application in physical inactivity, and even in the context of strenuous work. So at this point, I want to end my presentation by acknowledging the folks who've made this possible. First and foremost, my laboratory group shown here. Uh, you can see we were a very serious group, always working very hard. We're also very grateful to the National Institutes of Health, to NASA, the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, and the University of Kentucky for the funds, the resources, and facilities to do this work. Thank you very much.